OK, so today I'm going to go over some interesting plant facts for you all. And um, here are listed are just some of the topics that I'm going to briefly discuss. OK, so um, starting off with Kentucky diversity, um, as mentioned before, we have 2,164 native vascular plants. And compared to other states, that is low, but there are varying regional influences at play, um, which results in a very unique flora. So as you saw in Devin's talk, we have the coastal plain and Midwestern prairie influences from the west, um, the northern temperate forests from the north, and the Appalachian mountains from the east. And uh, this all results in just kind of a diverse state flora um, you can see there is an unknown for fungi. We don't actually know how many species of mushrooms occur in the state, as there hasn't really been a lot of studies done on this group of organisms. So if any of you in this group has a lot of interest in those, um, there would be a lot of new territory in the state for you to explore. Um, with lichens, we currently have 618 species. Um, but that number has increased every year, thanks to ours truly, Kendall, and uh, Dr. Risk out of Moorhead. Um, so we expect this number to continue increasing. So uh, listed here are the top 12 plant families uh, that make up 79% of all plant species in Kentucky. Um, Asteraceae, which is the aster family, is number one. Um, it's also number one worldwide and Poaceae and Cyperaceae come next, which are the two hardest families to learn. They are a lot less showy and require more um, knowledge of more technical jargon to learn a lot of their species. But I'm going to showcase some of these major plant families for you, um, some that you might encounter at your parks. And this is a very broad topic, so I'm going to um, try to provide some brief notes of important for each family and I'll be touching on economic and ecological importance as well as flower descriptions and any other tips that might make identifying um, plants in these families easier for you. So starting off with Asteraceae, um, you can see here some of uh, Kentucky's asters. This group includes the sunflowers and the goldenrods. It is the largest plant family with 366 species, and it's also one of the most showiest families in Kentucky. With goldenrods alone, we have 35 different species in Kentucky, and that can be broken down even further by varieties. So there's lots of plants. Um, in terms of economical importance, this family provides sunflower seeds, artichokes, cooking oils, and uh, leafy vegetables like lettuce. And some of the genera are of horticultural importance as well. Um, you get your marigolds, daisies, chrysanthemums, um, things like that from this family. In terms of ecological importance, uh, sunflowers and ragweeds produce high uh, oil rich fruits, high numbers of those, and um, they're important for a variety of game birds, especially the northern bobwhites. Um, songbirds like goldfinches, sparrows, and juncos, and, and also small mammals. And then um, thistle fruits are a preferred winter food for the American goldfinch. Um, the makeup of an aster flower is quite complex. What, what appears to be a single flower is actually a cluster of many flowers. So uh, what look like the petals that ring the outside of the flower head, those are actually called ray flowers and each one of those rays is a flower in itself. Um, the internal cluster of flowers are called the disc flowers, and um, they're usually much smaller than the ray flowers, and you can see uh, each disc flower has five tiny little pet, uh, petals fused together. Um, so flowers in this family are variable. They can have all ray flowers, like the chicory. Um, chicory is a non-native, but you commonly see it along roadsides. Um, Sunflowers have both ray and disc flowers. You can see the rays on the outside and the discs, disc flowers in the middle. And then um, our joe pie weeds, uh, which are common 
across the state, those are all disc flowers. You don't see any of the ray petals around the outside of those flowers. Um, so moving on to Fabaceae, the bean family. This uh, family has 136 species in Kentucky. Um, it's well known for nitrogen fix fixation, fixation in the soil. Um, there's a lot of important food plants in this family, like the soybeans, alfalfa, and peanuts. Um, this family has herbaceous and woody species, and some of the woody species are important timber trees. The, the northern bobwhite is one of the heaviest users of uh, Kentucky's herbaceous legumes, and also a variety of game birds and small mammals feed upon the foliage of um, trifolium, or clovers. In terms of um, flower description, the flowers are irregular and they have bilateral, bilateral symmetry, which means it can be cut in half and on um, both sides they're mirror imaged mirror images. Um, and the parts of the pea flowers are called the banner, which are the large petals, uh, the wings on the side, and then the keel is in the middle. And the proportion of the parts may vary, as you can see in the pictures of the native Kentucky um, Fabaceae on this slide. But um, as long as there is clearly a banner, wings, and keels, you can assume that it is part of the pea family. Um, and you'll notice that running buffalo clover is in Fabaceae. This is a federally listed plant and it occurs at Big Bone Lake State Park up in Adair County. So uh, the rose family has 130 species in Kentucky. There's many woody genera in this family and a lot of them contain cyanide-like compounds, um, especially in young or dried foliage and in the seeds, and those can have toxic effects. Um, this family includes a number of genera that are significant for wildlife. Uh, the fleshy fruits are consumed by a lot of small mammals and songbirds. Um, for example, black cherry is a major source of food to a lot of those um, organisms. Critagus, which is also known as hawthorns, the thorny branches provide really great cover for a nesting sites. Um, and the blackberry group is second only to the oaks as an important food source for wildlife in Kentucky. Um, it's the primary food source of food in the midsummer, with many of songbirds, game birds, and mammals seeking out those fruits. Um, and economically, it's important because there's <laughs> Uh, for the same reasons, many of those fruits um, that in, for example, apples, pears, apricots, plums, cherries, all of those fruit come from this family. The, the flowers are very showy. They are radially, radially symmetrical, meaning um, instead of where the peas only had the one line of symmetry, these you can cut it any way along the center and um, it'll be symmetrical on both sides. Um, and the, the flowers have five petals and they have a variety of fruits. Um, so not just berries, there's also follicles, capsules, nuts, akines, and droops. Um, the mint family has 98 species in Kentucky. Mint species are apparently really little used by wildlife, but they are however um, important economically. We get our aromatic oils from this group, like lavenders and rosemary, and also we get a lot of herbs from this family, like sage, basil, and thyme. And they can also be important ornamentals. Um, a lot of gardeners use coleus or salvias. Um, a tip for this family, uh, in terms of identifying it, if it has square stems, opposite leaves, where the leaves come off at the same point on the stem, um, as well as an aromatically minty smell, it, you can assume it's gonna be a part of this Lamiaceae. And also um, the flowers have bilateral symmetry. Um, the mustard family has 90 species in Kentucky. It's also important agriculturally. You get your broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, um, things like that from this family. Um, this, 
There's many species that are troublesome weeds in the mustard family, um, those being native and non-native. The flowers are in the shape of a cross, um, which is known as cruciform, which is also why this family has been known as the cruciferi. Um, but it has four petals and four sepals, and the unique pod-like fruits are called silicles and siliques. There's two different types. Um, and you can see on the slide that the diagram, there is a great uh, variation in shape and size of those fruits. Um, they always have alternate leaf arrangement and frequently those leaves can be um, dissected uh, in, like you see with the, the glade crest on the slide. And many species of this family are either peppery flavored or have a strong mustard scent. Uh, the Liliaceae has 81 species in Kentucky. These are perennial herbs from bulbs, and um, the flowers are very showy. They have six tepals, which are um, when petals and sepals are identical in size, shape, and color. The fruits are a three-chambered capsule, and the leaves are parallel veined, making it a monocot. Due to its very showy flowers, many uh, members of this family are used in gardens um, as ornamentals or houseplants. And this family also includes the genus Erythronium, the yellow trout lily you see on the slide, which is one of the um, early spring wildflowers that hopefully will be seen here shortly. And then also in the summer, it, it has the lilies. And um, the foliage and flowers of the lilies are toxic to plants, which is an interesting fact. Um, it's especially so in more cultivated forms. The carrot family has 55 species in Kentucky, and this includes the harbinger of spring, another spring ephemeral that we're hoping to see here shortly. Um, economically, it has a lot of foods like carrot, celery, and parsnips. The herbs and spices like anise, dill, coriander, um, and then also there's a number of species in this family that can be very poisonous, like poison hemlock or water hemlock. Um, and also they can cause photosensitize, photosensitization, like parsnip. Um, typically members of this family are aromatic herbs and they have alternate clasping and um, variously pinnately compound leaves. The flowers are often arranged in an umbel which is a flat topped cluster of flowers. Um, and each small individual flower has five sepals and five petals. Um, the fruits are schizocarps. Uh, they split open at maturity into two one seeded segments. Orchidaceae, um, the orchid family, is not one of the top plant families in Kentucky in terms of number of species, but it is one of the most aesthetically attractive and intriguing families. It is the second largest plant family in the world, right after Asteraceae, um, but in Kentucky we have 43 species. All Kentucky orchids are terrestrial, whereas um, in tropical regions you'll find a lot more epiphytic orchids where they're growing on trees. Um, flowering orchids can be found at just about any time in the growing season. Specifically, uh, the species, or I'm sorry, the genus Spiranthes, you can actually find a species of this flowering in any month of the growing season. So, Orchid seeds are really tiny and kind of wispy. Um, they're produced abundantly in the thousands, but because they lack endosperm, they require contact with a symbiotic fungi um, in the soil for su successful germination. Um, and unfortunately, they're often targeted by diggers searching for plants to either sell as ornamentals or for herbal medicines. And because of this, um, almost 50% of Kentucky orchids are now listed as rare in the state. So because our orchids require that presence of mycorrhizal fungi in their roots, it's, it's difficult and ill-advised to try and transplant these from the wild to get to cultivated. Um, this is something we really like to push um, or educate people on so that we can try and conserve our orchids. 
by digging them up, you'll likely just kill the plants, which is unfortunate. And um, at Nature Preserves, we do have an orchid conservation project. Um, we partnered with several organizations to do more research on some of our orchid species that are more rare than others. Um, in 2019 and 2020, we worked on the rose pigonia, small white lady slipper, Kentucky lady slipper, and the white fringeless orchid. Um, and some of the aspects of this project included seed banking, um, genetical analysis, mycorrhizal research. Uh, and on the slide, you can see a picture of a root clipping. This is part of research being conducted to determine the associated mycorrhizal re relationships with each of these orchid species. Um, and so far, we've been successful in determining the associated fungi with the white fringeless orchid. An important long-term goal of this project is the propagation of these orchids and their associated fungi so we can restore them back onto the landscape. Um, you can see in one of the photos is a baby white fringeless orchid that is currently being propagated at Atlanta Botanical Garden. So moving on um, to endemic species. Endemics are um, plants that exist only in one geographical region. And um, one problem endemics face often is habitat destruction. So um, here we are seeing endemic plants. Uh, they literally grow in Kentucky and nowhere else in the world. So it's pretty special. The Kentucky glade crest is, uh, it grows in Jefferson and Bullock County and it, it likes really thin uh, glady soils. Um, and the biggest threat to this plant is the urban sprawl that is exploding around the Louisville area. You can see on the map that it's just right around Louisville. So it's one that we're working to conserve. White-haired goldenrod, which was mentioned earlier, is uh, found in the Red River Gorge. Um, it likes sandstone rock shelters, and this is one that we were able to delist through efforts of multiple partners to protect these uh, rock shelters where it grows. Uh, threats include trampling by hikers or archaeological looters um, and rock climbing and the like. Um, and then finally, Kentucky clover is a new species that was recently described in 2013. This species is only known from two counties in Kentucky, and um, that would be Franklin and, Wood and Woodford counties. Um, it's similar to another of our clovers, Trifolium reflexum, except that it has decumbent stems, which, mean, which means they trail along the ground rather than being erect upright. And um, the Kentucky clover, we actually only know of two, two existing populations. So this is a project that Nature Preserve Botanists is currently actively looking for more populations of this plant. Moving on to endemics of Kentucky and Indiana. There's just the one which is Short's goldenrod, and this is a federally endangered species. It was first discovered in 1840 at the falls of the Ohio River near Louisville, but unfortunately that population disappeared after the construction of the dam on the Ohio River. It destroyed that habitat, but we still have it at Blue Lick State Park. Um, its suitable habitat consists of oak and rock open rocky areas like limestone glades or rocky slopes. And today, um, there are less than 20 populations, um, but we are actively working on restoring habitat for this plant so that it can flourish in the future. Tennessee, Kentucky, and Alabama, there are two endemic species. The egret sunflower, which Tara mentioned earlier, was delisted and uh, the necklace glade cress. Um, egret sunflower is found in the interior low plateau and it grows in barren forests. And the necklace glade cress is also found um, in limestone cedar glades. And um, it's a winter annual, which means it, it's well adapted for the extreme wet and dry seasons of cedar glades. Kentucky and Tennessee endemic plants. You can see there are a number of plants that occur in both Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, typically, they're going to be found either in the bluegrass region of Kentucky or the Appalachian Plateau. Um, 
My favorite is Lucy Brown's snake root. It also occurs in the sandstone rock shelters, um, similar habitat to the white-haired goldenrod. And you can see there's interesting similarities in the biogeography of some of these endemics. Many of them show up in both Kentucky's bluegrass region and Tennessee's Nashville basin. So this kind of goes back to the biogeography that Devin was talking about earlier today. Um, the forces of the biogeography of these plants is not entirely understood, although they, the, their plant ranges do tend to follow predictable patterns. So the bluegrass region of Kentucky and the central basin of Tennessee are very similar ge geologically. They're both underlain by ore division limestone. Um, so moving on to succulents, it's another neat group of plants. We have several uh, of these species in Kentucky, uh, the quill flame flower, the prickly pears, and our woodland stone crops. Um, so our native succulent species have thick fleshy vegetation and these are especially adapted to prevent water loss and they use cam photosynth photosynthesis which means their stomata open at night and they store the CO2 in acids which makes it available for photosynthesis um, when the stomata are closed during the day. Um, the Femoranthus tritifolius, the quill fame flower, it likes sandstone outcrops in the Cumberland Plateau. The prinkly pear, which is a puntia, is a native and it grows in sunny, rocky habitats. And then the woodland stone crop, strangely, it's actually a common spring wildflower in, and it's shade tolerant and it grows in music woodlands. Um, Parasitic plants, there's two. They're the holoparasites and the uh, hemiparasites. With the holoparasites, these uh, cannot complete its life cycle without exploiting a suitable host. Um, and several of these native species in the state are abundant and some are rare. And my particular favorite is sweet pine sap in the middle. I have quite the obsession of finding this rare plant in the spring. And the fun thing about trying to find this plant is that you can sniff it out with your nose. It's that pungent. Um, and also, sometimes it's necessary to have to sniff it out because it's so well hidden amongst the leaves. Um, so if you smell something like cloves while you're hiking around, uh, start looking for this little cutie. Um, and then there's also the daughters, which uh, they have various hosts, um, but they they're twining orange stems. There's the uh, Indian pipe, which um, its hosts are trees, and then the beach drops, which um, if you're seeing a lot of um, American beach in your forest, you, you might find this, this guy hanging out around its roots. And then the hemiparasites, these have chlorophylls, but they typically also need uh, to be parasite on the roots of plants other plants. Um, we have the American blue hearts. These parasitize hardwood trees. Um, Castilia parasitizes little blue stem. I thought that was neat that it's actually parasitizing a grass. And then um, mullein foxglove, it parasitizes oak trees. Carnivorous plants. Um, so these, these are really neat. We have a few of them across the state. They, they do are, tend to be very rare. Um, these plants need nitrogen and they get that from digesting insects. Uh, bladderwort, you'll find out in western Kentucky, these have modified underwater appendages called trap sacs and they actually trap the insects or small animals in, in those sacs. And you can see in that photograph, it's actually a little tadpole that's sadly being sucked in. Um, and then we have the sundews, Drosera intermedia and Drosera brevo, brevifolia. Um, these leaf blades are densely covered with stalked sticky glands and they secrete a sugary nectar to attract the insects. So once an insect gets um, touches onto the leaf, it actually rolls up around them and then it digests them with enzymes. Um, and they both do that similar strategy. So wetlands are included here as the plants that occur in them require specific adaptations to be able to survive in wet habitats. 
Um, generally speaking, wetland is a habitat where the soil's regularly covered by water or there's water present or, or it's near the surface of the soil. So you can find wetlands in a variety of places. There's a lot of them out west. Um, for example, um, Axe Lake WMA is the top left. Um, the bottom left is from James, John James Audubon State Park. Um, on Pine Mountain, you'll find a lot of bogs, um, as well as Appalachian seeps. And then along um, large rivers like the Rockcastle River, um, you can find riparian and scoured cobble bars along terraces of these rivers. So wetlands are anoxic, meaning there's very little oxygen down there. And um, plants have to adapt to be able to get oxygen to their roots, as well as exchanging other kinds of gases. Um, so some adaptions that these plants have are uh, shallow, broad roots. Um, a lot of herbaceous plants have hollow stems with air channels for exchanging gas. Um, bald cypress, which you'll find a lot of out west, um, they have these buttressed trunks, and they also have cypress knees, which there's been a lot of theories about cypress knees, but um, likely they're for stability and gas exchange. And then floating plants, um, for to keep afloat, they, they, uh, there's several different kinds of these. They, there's duckweeds, um, which you'll, you can see here, and there's also sponge plant, limnodi, lim, Nobium spongiae. Um, and then we also have a very special lichen, Leesbog lichen, in the top left. This is endemic to the Ohio River Valley in Kentucky and in Indiana. And this species depends on regularly flooding regimes, and it's Kentucky's only known endemic lichen. Um, so moving on to edible plants, there's a lot of resources online. And so um, I was just going to highlight a few edible plants that you could find along your parks or along trails in your parks. Um, dandelions, flowers can be made into juices, leaves can be added to salads or cooked, and the roots can be dried, stored, and made into a tea. Chickweeds are a common weed along trails. Um, the leaves can be used by adding them to raw to salads or sandwiches. Uh, wood sorrel, it's one of my favorites to snack on while I'm out in the field. Um, the genus is called oxalis, and the leaves actually have oxalic acid in them, which gives it the it gives them a very sour flavor. Um, so all the leaves, flowers, immature green seed pods, they're all edible. You can add them to salads, use them in soups, sauces, anything like that. Um, and you can also make a tea out of it. It's a very refreshing beverage. Um, another sour plant that I really like to snack on when I'm out in the woods is sour wood leaves. Um, good, good flavor for when you're out there. Um, and then another one is garlic mustard here in the middle. Noxious weed, but um, the flowers, leaves, roots, and seeds are all edible. And um, you can actually make a pesto out of it. So again, with medicinal plants, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and I just wanted to pick out a few that I thought you could easily find in your parks along your trails and use while you're actually hiking. Um, plantain, plantain leaves, uh, Plantago is the genus, but you can make a poultice out of these. Like if you were to get cut while you're hiking, you just chew up the leaves and you can put it onto a store and it's supposed to help heal. Um, impatience is a really great one if you've got burned or poison ivy. It's kind of got a soothing effect. If you crush up the stem, you can put that on the burn. And then the yarrow plant, um, I've never done this one, but I've read that you it staunches blood. Um, so it's also called staunch weed. And so if you get cut, you can crush up the leaves and put it on a cut. Um, a lot of our natives have purported medicinal values. And um, again, there's a lot of resources online for this kind of thing, but I, this is not something I'm an expert in. So before you actually do anything, I would highly suggest you do research on some of these. 
Um, but all of these things have medicinal properties. Oops, wrong way. Um, again, some more of our natives with medicinal properties. So, um, so far what I've gone over have mostly been vascular plants, and um, but we also have a bunch of different other plants in Kentucky. We have the seedless plants, which are ferns. Um, they're actually spore bearing, but then we also have non-vascular, which means they don't have xylem or phloem. So these are generally limited in size. Um, they, uh, you have the bryophytes, which are hornworts, liverworts, and mosses, and then we have the lichens. So, um, bryophytes are interesting. They can be used as indicators uh, of ephemeral streams later in the season when the water's gone, and they're also highly sensitive to water pollution. And because of this, they can be used as indicators of environmental health. Um, and then there are, as of 2010, a number of species in, there are three, 434 species in the state of bryophytes, um, but there's very few specialists in terms of like people in the state that study this group. Um, so it's definitely one that we could find a lot more species of with more people out there looking for them. So their, their rarity is not understood well. Um, so far, we have 18 state listed species and one watch list species in Kentucky. Um, hot spots where you can find some really neat mosses would be Black Mountain, Bad Branch State Nature Preserve, or Cumberland Mountains, all in the east, uh, eastern part of the state. Um, since you all had such a lovely presentation on lichens with Kendall, I won't go into too much detail. But in case you missed that, um, lichens are a symbiosis between algae and fungi, and they come in several different forms. Oops. You have your crustose that live with their substrate and cannot be easily removed. Then you have the folios, which are the leaf-like uh, lobes um, you see down on the bottom left. Then the squamulus, uh, which is a series of overlapping small lobes. And then there's the fruticose, which are a combination of squamules at the base on top of tall, and as well as tall stalks. Um, so currently there's 618 species found in the Commonwealth and 60 lichens are qualified to be state listed and one is globally imperiled. So to wrap things up, I'm gonna go through some of the different plants that you can expect to see in different seasons of Kentucky. In the spring, um, spring brings a proliferation of our ephemeral wildflowers. These species are early emergers that uh, they complete their annual reproduction cycle before the trees, the canopy trees leaf out. And early timing of these species helps them avoid competition with late, later emerging plants. So you get your spring beauties, your bloodroot, um, trout lily, trilliums, and um, a little, a little bit after the earliest ones, you get the orchids. Uh, many species flowering throughout the summer months uh, due to the abundance of warm temperature and long daylight hours. Uh, easy places to look for these include forest edges and openings, grasslands, roadsides, and riparian areas. Um, summer months is when you get all your milkweeds. So we get our butterfly weed and um, swamp milkweed and common milkweed and the like. You also get a lot of flowering vines during the summer. Our lobelias are in bloom as well as our ironweed towards the end of the summer. Um, and then late blooming plants in the Asteraceae family take advantage of late summer and fall sun and um, the new openings in the canopy as the leaves are dropping. So you, like I said, you get your goldenrods um, and then lots of different kinds of asters. And then one of my favorite plant groups is the gentians, which are really neat. Um, most species are restricted to high quality grassland rem remnants for gentians. And one of the state parks where you can find uh, a state listed gentian is at Blue Licks. 
um, where you can find the cream gentian. And then in the winter, there might not be quite as much color to look for, but if you know where to look, they, you can still find some interesting plants. Um, lichens, you can find those all year round, so they never go away. Um, you can also find woody buds to look at, which can have a nice color. Um, evergreen ferns are going to be there, rhododendrons, as well as your bryophytes. And then one of my favorites is your winter orchids. Um, two of these putty root and crane fly orchids, their leaves and flowering stems never really occur at the same time. Their leaves come up in the winter. Um, they produce just a single leaf in late fall, which persists through the winter. Um, and this gives them a head start on photosynthesizing. And then their flowers come up around summer, which allows them to avoid competition with other plants. So they have very similar leaves. The putty root in the upper left, it has the um, green with white stripes. And then the crane fly orchid has a purple underside. So um, those are two really fun ones to look for while you're, you're hiking out in the winter. Um, that's it for me. I know I went over a lot of information. Um, I didn't showcase all of the families. So if you want to know more details about some of the families I didn't go over or more details about some of the families I did go over, please feel free to contact me. Or if you have any plant ID questions, I'd be happy to help you all as well. So thanks.